in a sense, what's happened in the, the way the chapter set up is it sets up the, the, the classical duty argument in order to depart from it. So it's, it's sort of, um, yeah, to call it a straw man might be a bit too hard. But um, that's the point at which it moves away from. That's the point at which it, uh, it, it argues against. It's the point at which it departs. Okay. Um, what I really want to do in this introduction is to put forward an argument which is partially in the chapter and which Graham in some ways makes stronger in his chapter in this book where he's uh, writing about Lingus. Uh, Alfonso Lingus shows up in the chapter at a certain point, but uh, in this particular book, uh, written at the same time as this, um, or at least published around the same time, Graham uh, goes further, I think, in what he says using Lingus than he does in the chapter here. But I see it as a continuity, so in that sense I don't think I'm doing violence to the chapter by adding a little something. Okay, um, what I'm interested in is a therapy of passionists. Yeah. This conversation that Graham and I already had in Los Angeles, which refers to something coming up much later in the chapter. Much later in the chapter, uh, Graham sort of kicks at uh, Zizek and Lacan. And claims, in effect, that they're the wrong sort of humanist, the sort of humanist that creates a duality between the human and the non-human and by putting a sharp duality between the human and the non-human uh, makes uh, circumstance, makes context, makes relatedness more or less impossible. Because the issue is, how in heaven's name could you have ethics if there's no relatedness? How can you have uh, no objects and still have relatedness? Because if you want relatedness or relationship to be serious, it's got to be between some things. It can't just be nothing. Thus, if you want to take relatedness seriously, you're going to have to have not a holistic, not an entirely uh, soup sort of world where everything is uh, connected to everything. You're going to have to have some form of separation between the one and the other, between various objects. And if you don't have that separation, the definition of difference between various objects, then of course you have no actual interaction. If you have no actual interaction, you have no ethics, and everything collapses. Let's put Hello. terribly in the short, put terribly uh, uh, compact to start. Um, there is a necessity of uh, a multiplicity of objects for ethics to actually be the study of things in relationship to somehow really to each other. That something has to happen between things. Otherwise, Ethics is a quality of relationship. If there's no relationship, how can you have any quality of relationship? Thus, that's a sort of the, the, the basic uh, issue. And, um, I, right up. and the term that, to some degree, Graham already introduces when he uh, puts uh, Scheller in the, into this first chapter, but uh, uh, Alfonso, Alfonso Lingus develops much stronger, and that comes into the debate between Graham and Alfonso in his passion in philosophy book. Oh, okay. Is this issue of passion in this? this? In that sense, where I want to go to is the question of is ethics a question of passion in this? Are we really here to talk about the possibilities of passion in this? And linked to that, um, what happens if passionist collapses? What is existence without passionlessness? And in that sense, the way I interpret the cover is that passionlessness can break. It can collapse. It can become non-existent. And there is a, for ethics, and also I would say for a qualitatively significant form of human existence, passionateness is essential. Thus, the question is, for me, about the book, can we repair the hammer? Is passionateness repairable if it is broken? Okay, that is my 25 cent summary of my own presentation, which I have not yet held. <coughs> Backwards.
<laughs> Maybe I do too. These are the sources. Um, I sort of thrown this one up already like that, but now you can see it there. Um, the word I haven't thrown in yet is affect. Um, in specific, in the context of research, I would argue that um, the form that in research today we can talk about uh, passion and thus ethics. The way, how can research be ethical? Now the answer for that is at a university that you have a huge bureaucracy which full of stupidity and idiotic behavior tries to make research impossible. That's perhaps a little bit of a brutal way of saying it, but I really do believe it's more or less what's happening. Thus what would be ethics in terms of research? For me, ethics in terms of research has to do with the quality of affect between the researcher and the researched and the, if you wish, uh, professor or graduate student and his or her reader. Thus, for me, passion in research has to do with affect, has to do with the quality of response and awareness which is displayed in the key relationships of research. Well, passion is a much broader word for me, affect is a slightly more focused word. Um, I need a next slide of what am I supposed to do to make it happen? Oh, I just nod you there and you don't? Okay, I nod there. Okay. Part of the cast which is making up this particular show is sitting right there, thus it's fairly obvious. I thought it was a reasonable photograph looking at the ones that were available. This is <laughs> Alfonso Lingus. Hey, uh, he is someone who Graham studied with, I believe, at undergraduate level? Master's degree. Master's level. Uh -huh. And who's someone who uh, taught on our program in Utrecht, and thus everybody from the Utrecht background uh, knows him, and yeah. You, well, I was with him in China when well, I was thanks to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, lots of the connections to Alfonso Lo uh, were Brazil. in Chandu. But okay, uh, though I initiated it, to be honest. Uh, it was the first one. Um, the one tragedy, ah, that's too big a word. The one thing I really regret about uh, Lingus is I've never seen the, the Vogier. Evidently, he has this enormously magnificent uh, collection of birds at his home in Baltimore, and I've never gotten there to see it. So. That, that's something missing in my life. Um, yeah, Collins and Shaler are going to be important. They're part of the cast of characters. Of course, obviously part of the cast of characters very much in the chapter. And Nietzsche, I think, is playing a big role under the surface in the Lingus text, but is not named. But I couldn't not include him in the cast of characters. Okay, formalism. Personally, I was trained in the Chicago School of Literature in the late 1960s and early 1970s. If you're trying to come in here, do come in and please find a, can you, is it possible? Yeah, I guess way back there there's a place. Yes. School of Literature was all about formalism. 1960s, late 60s, uh, middle 60s really. Um, the issue was at the time, does anyone really read the novel? Does anyone really read the poem? Does anyone actually experience the piece of drama? And the criticism was that in faculties of literature, there was no experience of literature. They could tell you all sorts of biographical facts, they could tell you all sorts of background issues, and they couldn't actually tell you anything, of any significance about Moby Dick, about uh, the Heart of Darkness, about Ulysses, about significant written pieces of work. This what was formalism in that sense, in that context about, it was really a scream at people, would you please take the piece of literature really seriously? Would you please really try to understand how it's put together, how it works, what it's doing, how it relates to its readership, what it's doing? So in that sense, I experienced in that period, also in terms of uh, art criticism, where also there were lecturers, and also I had experiences of it, 
where it was, let's really look at. And in that sense, it would probably have been Batiste, Picasso, the, the, the great moderns, but it was again in terms of formalism, what's actually going on there? What is the nature of the composition? How is color being used? How do these paintings actually relate to much earlier works? Please, let's look at the piece of work and try to understand it. Let's try to find the piece of artistic work in its own terms. What goes wrong with formalism is at the point at which it no longer has that didactic quality of bringing someone into contact with, but becomes a sort of dead, utterly rational, procedural, conceptual straitjacket. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Thus, formalism had, I think, as I'm arguing, an extremely positive role at one particular point in mid, mid mainly, 20th century, but at the same time degenerated into a sort of connect everything by, connect the dots. Don't think, don't respond. Thus, the huge problem with formalism is what is its real effect? Is it bringing you closer to awareness of the object you're trying to relate to? Or is it becoming a sort of machine-like structure which makes contact impossible? Thus, the ambiguity of formalism is something that I think Graham is dealing with in this book and is very aware of its potential positive qualities and its potential destructive nature. Um, one form, of course, of formalism, which is heavily criticized in the chapter that I'm trying to fairly quickly review for you, is the formalism of Kantian ethics. Formalism has its value, arguing, when it brings you into contact with the material, when it brings you into relatedness to variety of materials, then we're, f we're doing something valuable. But the formal can become rigid, rationalistic, dead, dry, uh, so abstracted, so rule-bound, that it actually takes us totally away from the material and absolutely uh, puts us in a sort of rational uh, straitjacket. In a rational straitjacket, we'll have no motivation, we'll have no rewards, we'll have no punishment, we'll have no thrills, we'll have no terror, we'll have no uh, sadness, but we'll lose affect. Um, yeah. Part of the chapters, I've already said, is built upon the critique of, a, of the Kantian position and on um, this problem of the rational being as such. What would that be? What happens if you take such an extreme abstract category as the basis of your understanding and of all ethics? Thus, where Graham is working to in this particular section is really saying, Kant would abhor Dante, because Dante is messy and relatedness and not hyper-structured and nothing is universal. It's all in movement and purgatory, partial, unbalanced, uncertain. Thus, all the motion, all the activity, all the passion, which is, I think, an ethical response, gets lost in the hyper-duty abstractions in the Kantian tradition. Next. Uh, rational being developed, da, 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 da. Again, constantly, the, if you wish, a sort of complexity argument. Can truth, can goodness, can ethics be one thing? Or do we have to understand it as complex relatedness and moving and partial? The problem with real relatedness is it will create uncertainty. Because if your goal is to get an ethics of certainty, you're going to have lots of trouble with the messiness of actual dealing with, responding to, in relationship with. But that's what this part of the chapter is about, I would argue. Next, everything that I would argue or I say everywhere, we're fine. Um, okay. Having sort of done a quick Kantian nod, what Graham does is he moves over to 
a fairly also quick Shaler dot. And now we're into the insatiable love for things of the world. Because we're into passion. We're into the indefinite and uncertainty and complexity of more possibilities, objects, and relatednesses. And that, I think, is necessary for a living ethics, or for an ethics that can be lived. But it will not give you any sort of simple formulas. As someone who's had to teach uh, uh, business ethics, the one thing that the most business ethics classes abhor is the comment of, there are more possible ways of reading this. There are more possible ways of understanding this. There are more possible relationships here than one or two. And that there is a need for the involvement, but there is no possibility of simply making statements, this is the good and this is the bad. And of course, what business ethics courses tend to try to do is to reduce everything to, this is right, this is correct, this is good, this is bad, this is what you shouldn't do. That's what they try to do is become rigidly uh, prescriptive. And becoming rigidly prescriptive, the argument is, they become unethical because all genuine relatedness, all genuine taking account of the complexity of circumstance is being pushed out. Thus, ethics becomes unethical. Or is made unethical without the acknowledgement of love, the related fundamental affective relatedness. Next. Uh, I'll just save on that slide. Values, value, specific, loving being, playing of the heart as affect. Uh, yeah, that rank the ordering of loves. Poo poo. That gets difficult. This, Dante brings us into a difficult world or a difficult universe. And I would argue that Graham's philosophy brings us into a very difficult world when we try to apply it to ourselves or to, com to concrete circumstances. Because it demands of us that we acknowledge. His big move is he demands of us we acknowledge how many different objects and sorts of objects are all pulling and relating and having effects on each other and are affective to us. But the problem, of course, is, which and then the book in that sense is a bit of an answer, but not entirely, not really. The problem is, if you take a specific situation, how do you judge it? How do you rank or categorize or structure the different loves that you can acknowledge there? Yeah. It's just another way of saying what I just said, isn't it? That an object-oriented ontology demands, if we apply it, if we use it walking around in, relate, in actual circumstances, will demand particularity, will demand an acknowledgement of the specificity of this circumstance with all its objects and elements. And then the problem becomes, terribly difficult. How do you take decisions or how do you make judgments in a real particularity of many, perhaps, loves? If you want a slightly more Harmon word, you could say many different others, many different attractions, many different connectednesses. Yeah? Oh, yeah. One of the moves that Graham makes in the chapter is to say, watch out, there are two different uses of autonomy in the tradition, and that you need to be very aware of the, des the desirability of the one use of autonomy and the undesirability of the other. The one use of autonomy, which is desirable, is to say, yes, ethics is possible. Yes, judgment is really important and needs to be able to happen. This ethics has a sort of right to be addressed and a right to be existent. But the other form of autonomy, which is not the acceptable one in the, in the philosophical tradition, is the one that is saying the only form of judgment that really exists is human judgment. 
the world is ontologically totally split between human mind and all the rest. And that, of course, rolls into the Anthropocene debate and into the, 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 the uh, statement that um, human uh, uh, hubris is responsible for a great deal of evil. That's the one autonomy. Yes, ethics we will maintain. Yes, we will want to talk about questions of value. But the other sort of sense of autonomy, namely, only humans decide, only human mind has value. That is really an indefensible form of uh, uh, pride. Okay. Oh, yeah. I notice we have some agreement on this, but because uh, we talked about it in Los Angeles a few months ago. But um, in the chapter, there is critique on Graham's part of Zizek and Lacan. And I want to counter that critique by saying Graham is absolutely right if you take Zizek and uh, Lacan as philosophers. Then their statements about the human are irresponsible in relationship to the autonomy issue. But I wish like to insist that Zizek, in his way, and Lacan, very strongly in his way, are therapists. And just as in a good therapy, you should never take what your psychologist tells you literally, you cannot really take Zizek, in my opinion, or Lacan, literally. I think that their statements are being made to provoke and to, in Lacan's case, directed towards clients, and in Zizek's case, which fascinates me even more, directed towards the general intellectual community. I think what these people are trying to do is therapy. And I think that therapy is absolutely essential in, this, uh, in the base argument. If we're going to repair the hammer, we need therapy. What sort of therapy can we create whereby people will be willing to enter the complexity the messiness and the interactive qualities which an object-oriented ontology demands of people in concrete situations taking action. And I think that Zizek is very good in provoking the right sort of therapy, getting us upset, getting us uh, passionate, getting us out of our comfort zone, forcing us to intellectually be unsettled and emotional. The intellectual scene is too Kantian, is too dry, is too without affect, is too unethical in that sense. And what Zizek tries to do is to force us into a relatedness whereby we would become, in terms of what Graham's writing, more ethical. Next slide. Yeah, the, the, this is, rolls in at that point. But it is uh, an ontology, obviously, again, which totally sees animals as soulless machines. The Cartesian form is going to be totally inadequate to a ethics of relatedness. Next slide. OK. Alfonso Lingus is interested in a perceptual imperative. The set is a necessity to see. He's into an ethics of relatedness, and he's most certainly not prioritizing only an ethics of rational being. But we're looking here at an ethics in the world, which is what I've been trying to describe to you for the last, I think it must be about 10 minutes. Here's the value of formalism slide. I really did that at the very beginning. Thus, um, yeah, I, I've done it. <coughs> if we don't accept an object-oriented ontology, realize in what a horrendous sort of floating in empty space work we get into, we end up in a terrifyingly empty nowhere. That's that first comment. Uh, OK. Love is the basic ethical unit. But we need to take all sorts of objects very seriously. I've said it. Love is and has to be worldly. Yep. 
and always compound, never singular. And of course, one of the huge problems is that when we tend to write as academics, the one thing we're never allowed to be is compound. We have to be singular. It's supposed to be one argument, one perspective, one point you're defi defining and defending. If you get into the compound when you write as an academic, you almost always will get attacked as being confused, uh, unclear, uh, not academically uh, rigorous enough. Thus, the prejudice against the compound in the intellectual community is enormous, and that, I would argue, is why Zizek is so extreme. Because what he's trying to tell us is extreme. In the postscript now, that was my effort to sort of summarize, Oops, sorry, to summarize this before I would throw it anywhere, my excuses for throwing you. Uh, that was my quick effort to summarize the argument. Now we're continuing. This is a short, oh, there always are. It's a short essay by Lingus. His essays always are short. One of the things about Lingus which is difficult is that in my opinion, at least he never ever tells you what his essays are about. You have to figure that out yourself. He's not willing as an author to ever tell you this is about that. Which means reading him is rather difficult because you've got a, it's a horrible mystery puzzle. What's this one about? It's called this, which is a mountain. It's about this man who is a psychiatrist, if I remember correctly. Certainly a therapist, but I think it was a psychiatrist. In Buenos Aires, who's published this book with the title of The Mountain, and it's the story of the psychologist with his client. Lingus immediately says, I was at the mountain, and I was at a, a sort of ski hut sort of thing, and I found the book there, and it was published by the psychologist himself. This immediately, of course, raises the potential question, is, does the book really exist? I've done my very best to find out, and the answer is, I don't know. If I, next time I see Alfonso and ask him, does the book really exist? But it probably may not be important, but it's the sort of thing you, you, you get bugged by it. You want to know, does the thing really exist? I don't know. Next slide. Miguel is the patient. Highly successful. According to the story, his sex life is fine. His, his um, uh, business is, is marvelous. His social contacts are fine. All the normal checklists that you get at an, at an intake conversation with psychologists, everything is fine. What is wrong? A yawning feeling of empty. Thus, in terms of normal rationale about human positions, in terms of normal sort of, to use something horrible, Maslow, can, can I be so insulted? In, sort of, in terms of that sort of, mm, uh, everything's fine. And this man feels a yawning sense of emptiness. And what does this therapist say? Come climb the mountain with me. Next. Oh, the rapids terrorize my dogs, etc. That's a typical list of objects by Linus. And I don't remember exactly how the slides work, so I'll just tell you the story and it may show up again on the slide. <laughs> what happens in the therapy is that they go to climb the mountain. They do not get to the top. They have to go back. At which point, you find out in the story, this is the third time that the therapist has done this. It's the third time that the therapist has taken somebody to climb the mountain as therapy and it's the third time that they have not reached the top. What do I think this is about? Existence without passion is a gray, unethical, depressive hell. But the idea that there will be success is a falsity. That's what relationship between two objects in the sense of fundamental relationship between human beings is about is partiality limits effort passion but they don't ever lead to some sort of rational this is the success therapy is passionately necessary and will always fail and that's not bad I think that's what Lingus is trying to tell us in this, in this chapter. And I think it's in a way what 
Graham's ethics is also all about. Next slide. Yeah. Passionate attachments are not utilitarian. They're not proportionate. They're out of the box. They're, they're insane. They're, they're the marvelous. Where we have to be terribly worried, and for us, I guess, that would be also in the middle period of René Timbos, is uh, when it's made into quasi-fascist political forms. That's when the necessity of passion can be terrifying. And then that's Trump. And one of the problems in the argument of, of myself and of Graham and of uh, Alfonso is how do we get Trump out of our ballgame? Because he's trying to kick into our ballgame and we don't want him in there. But there are problems there. Yeah, slide. Oh, this is the uh, the argument. Okay, we don't need it. It's okay. What I want to say that I've said in the the, the, the anti-argument, I'll just leave. Okay, petty attaches for passionate moments. Is there a loving self in the everyday? I don't know. The hammer can break because there is significant affect of passion is that can be broken. The crisis, the ethical crisis of our world is that and the affective relatedness and the passion is this is often repressed and destroyed. And then you get a whole different discussion and it gets philosophically really rough at the point at which I try to combine Stiegler with this particular tradition and then I get all sorts of mythological issues which will make my life very, very unhappy and luckily I don't have to try to do that here. But the specificity, what I do have to say, is the sort of historical sociological specificity of what is destroying the hammer in the society we live in, that is not developed as a theme in uh, Graham or in Alfonso. And I do feel a sort of ethical necessity. What he says is, in a, and now I'm doing a persiflage a bit, but what he says in a way is, on a certain level, I love Latour. Thus, I had to write those books about Latour. And when I and I did some 50 of them. When I used to be a PhD supervisor, the key question I really asked each student, the way we used to ask it actually came from Copenhagen, from Asmund, and that is what makes your piss uh, uh, boil? Which is a question that has been born from uh, Copenhagen, that we adopted. What are you passionate enough that you really think it's worth working on for four years and writing a book about? That was always when we were supervising together, that's quite a few people around the table, together that project in Utrecht. That was always the fundamental first ethical question of someone starting to write a PhD. And I think we got that right. But did we ever, did we repair any hammers? I guess in secret I hope just a little bit. No, we failed all that. That was the issue we just mentioned. <laughs> Next. Uh, yeah, I can break. We not passionate, we cannot offend against a person, we use those words. We can become muffled, expressionless. This is the danger of passion. Trump is passionate, his supporters are passionate. There is a deep fundamental danger of passion, but there is no life and no ethics without it. Trying to rationalize all risk away in a sort of Kantian mindset does not address the fundamental problem of ethics. Because what we're here to talk about is being true to one's passions. Yeah. Therapy and philosophy are not the same thing, granted. Philosophy can be inspirational towards us when we try to address fundamentally, for instance, Miguel, the patient situation, the so-called success, who is totally of spirit, of life, of relatedness, emptied. It's the third time he mounts and fails to mount. Therapy is not truth, it's a relationship. 
Therapy is about opening one to affective objects. And what I do is I take Graham's writings as a point of departure for cultural therapy. He's done a little bit the same with his book about uh, the Beyoncé, but that's not his first commitment. It is my first commitment. But he is important for me to understand what I'm attempting to do. Yeah, the truth of therapy is passion is truth of today of an ethical text is to find, explore, show, share. And then you get a horrible word like genuineness. You get a word, trick word, a word that uh, I have to remain uh, very uncomfortable with, passionless. Saturday evening in the uh, South Stalberg in uh, Amsterdam, uh, Robert LePage's 887 was shown. Um, he's a Quebecois uh, uh, theater producer. It was an absolutely fascinating evening. It got an instant, enormous standing ovation. One person only on stage for two hours, speaking an English which was fine and a French which was sheer hell. He chose to Quebecois his French as extremely as you can, and that makes life very hard, even for someone like Jean-Luc. It's totally uh, 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 difficult French. Um, his father was a taxi driver. It's the taxi. He grew up in this apartment building where he tells all the stories of all the various people. What happened there is that a political treatise about the status of Quebec and the status of the French in Quebec, an ethnography of a family and of the people in the family and around the family, and also the fact, for instance, that he was not accepted at the Jesuit school because his grades and his, uh, he did all the stuff and they said, you're excellent, the only trouble is, we're not willing to accept that the son of a taxi driver can pay the tuition, thus he was rejected. This is in the 60s in Quebec. And it was excellent ethnography. It was insightful politics, and it was theater. Thus it was, in my opinion, and in all those criteria, check the boxes, it was excellent. There are fundamental form experiments. I think Alfonso is always on fundamental form experiments. But there are here fundamental possibilities of form experiments when we follow the line of thought with which uh, Graham and, and Alfonso are bringing to us. Thank you. That was my effort to set up some potential themes or issues for further discussion. Thank you very much. try and do retreating chairing, so I'm only going to chair if you start misbehaving and talk over each other in idiotic ways, but otherwise I enjoy you just to converse collectively about uh, the yeah. themes in play, but would you yeah. like to pick Some up? Other response? Yeah. yeah, that was a wonderful way of getting right to the heart of the book, and uh, as I've had a chance to read the book so far already, you'll notice that I'm structuring the book around constantly critiques, which are very much the center of modern philosophy critique of theories and the critique of uh, practical reason, the critique of judgment. Though I'm doing them out of order, just like I'm doing Dante's three parts of the afterlife out of order, for various reasons. Um, so I thought that got right to the heart of it, and I, it's a wonderful idea to bring that biggest essay into it. I haven't looked at that in a long time, so I've forgotten the exact details of the story of the mountain climbing until you reminded me. All right, um, a general remark, and then I'll answer the Trump and Schmidt point, because I think I have an answer for it. Uh, I think Bernard Latour's We Have Never Been Modern it goes a long way towards getting at what is wrong with modern philosophy. Uh, he talks about how it amounts to an attempt to purify pure nature from pure culture, so that you're always favoring one or the other. If you're in the natural sciences, you tend to want nature uncontaminated by human political concerns. And if you want pure culture, then you think everything is an arbitrary projection of human values on the cold, lifeless matter. And you can flip back and forth freely between the two. You're just never supposed to mix it. Latour does a nice job of Critiquing this. I think it's a brilliant book. I think it's going to be remembered as one of the key late 20th century books as time goes by. Uh, however, Latour is not quite as symmetrical as he claims to be, in the sense that one of his arguments against pure nature and pure, pure culture, famously, is that there are a lot of hybrid objects that you can't pigeonhole as being either nature or culture. So there's that uh, garbage dump in France 
that appears early in his book that at first the Green Party wants it closed down, but then they want it to stay open because it turns out some rare animals have made a home in this garbage dump. And so it's flipped. And so it's that nature of culture. The ozone hole, well, it's culturally created, but it's part of nature now, and so it's increasing skin cancer in Australia and whales with sonar tracking devices and uh, strawberries with gene splicing. And it's hard to put your finger on a little whether these are natural or cultural. And so he says hybrids have increased more than ever during modernity, despite the rhetoric to the contrary. The problem I think Rick Swift falls into is he tends to drift into this idea that everything's a hybrid. I would say that everything's a compound, not everything is a hybrid. Because if you say everything's a hybrid, that means humans have to be everywhere. And this is why you get him saying things like, Ramses II couldn't have died of tuberculosis because it hadn't been discovered yet. The tort is most controversial, it's most social constructionist. Or uh, microbes did not exist before Pasteur. Uh, because there's got to be a human there or else it's not a real object. Whereas we can easily see that you can't have water without hydrogen and oxygen, but you don't need a human there for water to exist. Right? A human is not part of the compound of water. It's a different compound. So I think that's where he goes to the uh, He wants to make everything relational, and he identifies the non-relational with nature, and he identifies the relational with the human. So he ends up being less symmetrical than he claims to be at the beginning. So in some ways, you could read Dr. Green on ontology, even though it started as a reading of Heidegger. You could met with Latour later in the late 90s, and you could see it in some ways as, as ANT with a difference. ANT with this idea of an unexpressed residue in the things, something that's not relational in the things. And I tried to show in the book, book that the materialism on the Dutch East India Company, that there are real consequences for this in how you read historical entities. That you can't, ANT would tend to read things in terms of ranking the most dramatic events in which a thing is evolved as the most important. Whereas that's often not the most important. I tried to come up with this, use this concept of symbiosis in order to give an alternative idea of how you define the important things in the history of a, an entity like the Dutch East India Company. So that's that's really the core of the book is trying to get around the fact that Kant makes this very modern separation, and all three of his all three of his critiques are based on this modern separation between human and the world. And it's always the human side that's important. It's duty, apart from any consequences in ethics, it's transcendental faculty of judgment as opposed to art objects in the case of arts and in the case of metaphysics it's about the appearances the structure of transcendental structure of appearances rather than the things themselves and I'm trying to say that all three of those are wrong and Kant is a great philosopher the greatest modernity problem that's we I think we need to reverse all of those all right and the way we do that is by seeing their compounds let me say one thing actually about arts before I get into trumpet schmidt uh, early on the history of object oriented ontology, which is not a long history, late 90s until now. Uh, one of the artists, Triple O as we call it, has done very well in arts and especially architecture. But early on, uh, I didn't really have an orientation in those fields. I had no training in those fields. I have an enthusiasm for those fields. And there was a Polish American artist named Joanna Malinowska who was one of the first to really take the bull by the horns. And she had read my book, The Real Metaphysics, my second book from 2005. And she, she had a very successful show in New York called Time of Guerrilla Metaphysics. And I was reading her interview about this show. I don't know her personally. She just picked up the book somehow. And one of the pieces she did, which I was very uh, delighted by at the time, was that she, okay, she took this idea of objects without humans. And she, one of the things she did is she took a solar powered, we call them boom boxes. I don't know what you call them in the UK. These little portable stereos, solar powered. She started marching towards the North Pole and went as far as she could in performance piece. And it was, it was uh, Glenn Gould played Bach Fuse using the solar power from Bach. Great choice. And she went she went as far into Arctic nowhere as she put it as she could, and then she just left it there. This blue box playing Glenn Gould playing Bach and then marched back towards New York. And the idea being that this music probably still is playing somewhere, but there are no humans to hear it. And it will continue to do so until global warming melts that ice and sinks to the bottom of the ocean. This is a wonderful idea. And I used to, when people ask me to give an example of triple O inspired art, I'd always give that example. And then something happened in 2012, and he stopped giving that as an example. And that was, was a conference in France. The, it's a lake in the exact geographical center of France. It's not far from the Gauche. The name escapes me at the moment. It's an artificial lake at the exact center of the uh, There's an island there, there's an art center. Whatever it's called, we had an art conference there, and somebody asked me a question that I didn't understand it. What would an art without humans look like? And I didn't have a quick answer to that. And I didn't think about that for some reason. And then I realized, after a couple of weeks, 
question misses the point. We don't want an art without humans. We want an art that is deeper than any human observation of it. It doesn't follow that humans are not an ingredient to the art. So you can make a distinction between humans as ingredients and humans as observers. I'll give another example. Anwal Delanda in his nice book, uh, The Philosophy of Society. Realist Philosophy of Society. Delanda begins that book by saying, he wants to do a realist philosophy of society. It means society is as it is apart from humans. He says, you're going to say that's possible, because how can you have a human society apart from humans? And he says, you can't. Humans are a necessary ingredient in human society, but society still has a reality deeper than human understanding of it. And that's, I realize, what Triple O is trying to do with art. So in other words, um, I don't think there can be art without humans, or basketball without humans, or chess without humans, or human society without humans. In the sense that humans must be an ingredient. Just like you can't have water without oxygen. Ask all the water without oxygen, but you can't have it. Well, you can't have art without humans in that sense, unless some of the higher animals can experience art in ways we don't have dolphins experience. Or just, I don't know. Forgetting that for the moment. But what we want is a sense of art that's autonomous from human critique, human perception, the reality that's there, deeper than our reaction to it, or deeper than the socio political effect of it. And that, that maybe needs a turn towards, at first, a turn towards formalism. The idea that the artwork has a certain autonomy. I wouldn't say that it can never have a socio-political connection. I would just say that that's always going to be a very selective one. It's going to be certain cases and only certain connections. So Picasso's Guernica obviously has a certain connection with the Spanish Civil War and Hitler. Uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin has an obvious connection with slavery. You know, if, if Harriet Beecher Stowe had written that novel as a fantasy about a world where slavery existed and it hadn't really existed here, it would be a different novel. Much of its force comes from the fact that slavery was a real thing she was attacking. So, uh, formalism becomes an important moment in the triple approach to arts. However, it doesn't mean that the human can't have any, any interaction. The problem, I think, with formalist criticism in visual arts, Clement Greenberg and Michael Fried, is that they're simply flipping Kant's formalism. So instead of the human mind being the important thing, it's the object that's the important thing. And you don't want the human mind involved. So Fried is very hard on theatricality, as he calls it. And um, they both, they favor the art objects being contemplated in a disinterested manner, because the human aspect is supposed to be gone. Now, I end up arguing, I, don't, I think in this book too, that art is necessarily theatrical, because it's a compound that's made of us and the artwork. It's neither side is privileged. There's still an autonomy, because my encounter with that artwork is irreducible to anything I can say about that encounter. This is why art criticism is always indirect doesn't speak in clear prose terms the way science tries to, because art criticism has to be an artwork, in a sense. It has to get it hanging directly. Um, so one of the consequences of that, of course, is that a lot of the post-1960s art forms that are simply dismissed by Greenberg and Fried, like street performance, conceptual art, and minimalism, all of these post-Greenbergian art movements that started in the 60s, anything by Joseph Boyce, uh, all of these things are back in play now. They're back in play as potentially arts, not just something that's bad postmodernism. So we, it, in other words, it's not it's not simply bad if somebody is if a person is involved in the artwork. It's not necessarily good either, but it's a lot of it's crap. But it's not necessarily bad. Okay, now this for this for passion and Trump and Schmidt, this is very interesting. Um, on the Trump point, I've been persuaded by Latour's reading of Trump, which is available so far only in newspaper articles in France. But he, he has me convinced, like everyone else, I, I despise Donald Trump, I have to say. I'm sure most of you do. As an American citizen, I'm appalled, embarrassed, ashamed, angry. I probably spend 60 to 70 percent of my conversations on no exaggeration. I need to my friends about Trump. Uh, I want out by any means necessary. Um, I see the United States declining in many ways already during the short time comes from power. And I, like everybody else, I was calling him a fascist. Now, obviously, he doesn't have the power to do the sorts of things that we saw fascist in the 1930s. But it's really the point that convinced me that Trump is not really a fascist. He's an escapist. And Trump is actually a political innovation. We haven't seen escapism as a political but The argument is, what are the two most pressing political issues in the world today? You can make a good case that it's global warming and refugees. Those two are going to feed off each other. Global warming is going to make the refugee problem worse. If you have the refugee problem worse in Europe than we do with this whole Mexican thing is an artificial, most of them are going back to Mexico. So it's a pretty artificial crisis that Trump is manufacturing on our side. 
But uh, uh, Trump is systematically refusing to face up to either of those. He's pretending they don't exist. He's pretending there's nothing. Climate change, he's pretending there's a refugee problem. They don't have to take any serious. Um, so that's how he's reading Trump. Trump is actually systematically avoiding reality, whereas for me, passion involves a contact with reality. That's why, for me, aesthetics is so essential to passion, because for, for, for those reading art, art is about the object that cannot be contained. And we have to stand in theatrically to replace that missing object. It's our passion for the qualities of the thing that place the missing thing itself. And we agree or disagree with that. And so for me, there's always an ingredient of reality in true passion, and Trump doesn't have that. Trump is trying to stir up emotions over what Kant would call dogma. Dogmatic pronunciation or pronouncements about immigrants. It's not, not really in touch with reality. Uh, and it's, I was mentioning last night at dinner, America has this tendency to elect a president who is the opposite in some way of the previous president. So we had, uh, uh, after Bush, who had, was widely regarded as stupid, we choose the Professor Obama. And after Obama, who was considered a kind of cold, emotionless professor, we choose the populist Bell Razor. So I'm wondering if the next opposite is Bernie Sanders, who at least is unfailingly honest. Watch him, he's not the truth. I'm not getting that from our president. Um, okay, so that's so much for Trump. I want to move on to Schmidt quickly and then open up the floor to everybody. Schmidt is very interesting. Um, just a brief history of my, my book on the tourist politics, which some of you may know. I'll do this very briefly, just not to waste time. Um, when I proposed that, I was asked to write that book, but I had to write a proposal and I had to go to referees. Sent out to four. They were all very useful. One of them, though, however, said, I'm glad he's going to try this book, but I think the tourist politics are just going to end up being Mike Makes Right. And I took that criticism very seriously. Now, when I dug into it, I saw that that was mostly true of the tour's early phase. The tour's early phase, he sounds like this swashbuckling Machiavellian and Hobbesian that if you're right without might, then you, you failed, you're pathetic, you need to put your supposed truths into action and build up networks of allies and succeed and prevail. Uh, this is what his early politics are all about. No question. But then it changes, and it changes and we have never been modern, because we're he's arguing there against Schaefer and Schaefer here in the UK, who wrote that famous book on Hobbes and Boyle, the controversy over the air pump, where Hobbes, Boyle said, yes, you can see the truth directly using honorable witnesses. You can see the vacuums being created and suffocating the mouse and putting out the candle. And Hobbes not only disagreed with this, he reported Boyle to the British Secret Service as a danger to the state. Of course, <laughs> Hobbes thought uh, religion must be controlled by society, but he also thought science must be controlled by society. Both are dangerous. Both attempt to transcend social consensus and the will of the sovereign. And so Hobbes was very appalled by this. And then Schaefer and Schaefer conclude the book by saying Hobbes was right, because society decides what counts as good standards of science. So therefore, sociology circumscribes science. And the tour says, no, Hobbes was wrong. If we're going to deconstruct science, we also need to deconstruct power. And I think that's when the tour's career really begins. And where that leads him politically is that in the early 21st century, under the influence of Norcia Morris, a country woman of yours who studied with the tour at, the, at Amsterdam and the LSE, wrote a very good dissertation on Dewey and Lippmann. And you all know John Dewey. Walter Lippmann is not as well known today, but he was probably the world's most famous journalist in the 1920s. And he wrote a very interestingly cynical book about American democracy called The Man of Public back in the 1920s, which argued basically that um, American ideology is we educate all of our students because we're a democracy, and in democracy, all the citizens need to make informed choices, so they need to be educated. Now, in practice, that doesn't happen. In practice, we have a lot of idiots vote that's based on pure appeals to emotion, and we saw the results of that it's last November. We're easily swayed by the flimsiest propaganda, aren't studying anything, I'm barely an acquaintance with the map of the world. So it's not happening, and that was already a problem then. And Lippmann's conclusion was, therefore, America must become a technocracy inevitably. We need rule by experts. There will be experts in each area, scientists will be in charge of nuclear, well, there were nuclear bombs then, but if you were alive, you would have said, a scientist will be in charge of nuclear policy and so forth. And so we read this book, and of course Dewey was very pro-democracy, pro-American democracy, and his reaction to this was, uh, Lippmann is, is right in a sense, but he proved the wrong solution. The problem is Lippmann thinks that there needs to be huge public involvement on every issue, when in fact each issue has its own public, and this is Norton Morris's point. There's, there's no public without an issue that generates a specific and limited public. And 
And there has to be debates around that particular issue by all the stakeholders. That's one issue is that there has to be a lot of, a lot of stakeholders involved on in every issue. And the other point about this is that consensus is reached, but a truth is never reached. If you reach a point where you cut off the decision making, while realizing that you may be wrong and you may have to open it up again. And so there's never any access to political truth. This is one of the original things. This, there's a kind of consensus. And this is where Schmidt comes in to some extent, because Schmidt, of course, says uh, it's, it's a kind of decisionism. Just make a decision at some point. And also that it's, it's simply a question of defeating your enemy, not of annihilating them. Whereas Schmidt accuses liberal countries of making war a matter of good and evil. And we see this in the United States. The American public is reluctant to get in a war unless we demonize the enemy first, usually in the form of an evil leader who is worse than his people. So, we don't hate the Iraqi people, we hate Saddam because he's an evil person. We don't hate the North Korean people, it's Kim Jong-un was crazy. Usually crazy is what we call them, crazy and evil Hitler. Our favorite list of, of wars includes demonized leaders in almost every case, because it has a point. And liberal governments, you tend to only want to get involved when you're destroying evil, fighting evil. There's not this realpolitik tradition, a little more common continental history, where you're just trying to fight wars for limited ends. Um, now here's the thing, uh, Schmidt, uh, sorry, this war makes very interesting use of Schmidt in his lectures on Gaia, which is now a book. He calls for the first green Schmittianism, which is to say we need Schmittian warfare against climate change skeptics, because I'm sick of debating with these people, right? They, they no longer have a case, they're just causing trouble and delaying, and you know, we don't have to call them evil, but we have to say the time to argue with these people is past, so let's get over it. Okay, I think he may have a point on that specific issue. Best critique of Schmidt out there that I know, and remember, Schmidt was a Nazi, but the left loves Schmidt. They see him as someone who recognizes the truth that you know, politics is essentially violence. That you can't be free of violence the way bourgeois liberals want. You have to face the facts and face up to the necessity of the struggle with the enemy. Uh, the most interesting critique I know of Schmidt comes ironically from the right. It comes from Leo Strauss, who is huge in the U.S. And Strauss makes this critique from a kind of platonic perspective. That is Schmidt. I mean, sorry, Strauss says against Schmidt, and they knew each other. So, whatever Germany says that the, the seriousness of the question over friend and enemy is based on the seriousness of the distinction between right and wrong. Okay, because uh, in the Republic, Rusinicus says that justice is the will of the stronger. Might makes right. It's whoever wins. It's right. But what if the stronger does something that hurts other people? So the stronger might say, "I don't care. It's all about me." The stronger might do something that hurts himself as well. And there he might care. You have to be wise in order to use strength in a way that helps you rather than hurts you. And this is Strauss's point against Schmidt, that there needs to be some room for the question of the good in politics, or else it simply turns out that it might make rights. In other words, Latour would simply be flipping back to his earlier Hobbesian phase in the guise of Schmidt. And Latour has always said that right-wing political theorists are often more interesting to read. You know, if you read the good guys like Rousseau, you don't learn as, as much about politics as if you read Machiavelli or Hobbes or Schmidt. And I see his point. There's a certain realism of these right-wing political thinkers where they're trying to stare something in the face and realize that human life isn't the paradise we like to think it is. But um, I worry that he's leaving out the question of the good, and, and so that Schmidt will be leaving out passion, because Schmidt is leaving out reality in a sense. It's just we're making a decision, we're fighting the enemy, we're not leaving that openness. So. That's why I think Trump and Schmidt are not the real risk uh, for this ethics of passion, as you call it. Sorry, I talked a while. Thank you. Sure. Who wants to chip in? Oh, go ahead. Uh, I wanted to take up the point on uh, therapy as repairing that. Um, because it seems to me um, this kind of jumps into the aesthetics part two. Um, is it not the case that the broken hammer is the aesthetic experience? It's the real object spitting its qualities. Uh, I feel like that's, that's the, the point of the, the metaphor of the broken hammer. And therefore, isn't it, isn't it the case that we should want to break the hammer? We should, we should, if, if art has to be uh, the irreducible object, which cannot, be, which cannot be itemized in terms of its qualities, which cannot be easily united with a list of uh, criteria, then surely having the broken hammer is what we're looking for in aesthetic experience and in ethical experience, because the ethical experience is about 
turning your spirit towards an object and finding it infinitely invested in, then it's not having a split between the voice and the object what reduces the passion. Yes, and I think it's something that Trump is not succeeding in doing. There's no broken hammer for him because there's no reality. And so, yeah, I might not be on board with repairing the hammer. Now, therapeutically, um, you know, for the calm, the, the point of therapy, I guess, is to free yourself from the gaze of the big other and assume your own desire. And is that a broken hammer sort of experience or not? I, I, maybe not quite, because I don't think there's, the calm's real is real enough. The calm's real is, it's too entangled with the symbolic. It's not really something outside the human. Uh, he's got a pretty weak sense of that as the Zizek. So that, there I'd probably agree with you. There's, there's not really the sense of the real, the sense of reality that I would want in those two. Can, can I um, yeah. just come in on that? Um, yeah, I, I sort of want to follow that kind of broken hammer thing a little bit. Um, and you made a fascinating point in the way you talked about Harmon's work in a sense when um, you had that mountaineering fellow always failing. And I'm wondering if why it fails is significant. And I'm just going to relate that to, the, to your sort of remark about Zizek because it seems to me on, on reading Graham's work and, and reading a little bit of Zizek Reality and being are quite different in a sense. For Zizek, it seems to be, he's always on about being being unfinished. And he's got that thing he always talks about, about the computer game. Um, Whether, you know, the sort of, the door never opens because it's just pixels, because it's, it's not finished. And God hasn't created the Higgs boson yet, he's going to be pissed off when he comes back because we're all working at a molecular level. And, you know, he's got that sort of image of, of reality being unfinished. Whereas Harmon, it seems to me, reality or being is, it's always receding, it's, it's recalcitrant, it's quite different. And you said that um, ethics and, ther and therapy always fail. I can see why therapy would fail if, if being unfinished in that sense. But it, it, you kind of have said that Graham's ethics would fail, and I'm wondering if it's failed because of being, it's a different sort of failure if you understand. I don't know if that's worth pursuing, but anyway, sorry, I haven't got a specific question there, but maybe it's not. Uh, um, next one question I think to ask is, do the Kant's ethics fail? And I would say probably yes. Um, I'll work from there towards, why do Kant's ethics fail? Well, I would agree with Shaler that the autonomy part of the ethics is important, because if you have ethics based on rewards and punishments of any kind, right, the ethics of goods and purposes, he calls it, and that's not really an ethics. You're talking about a means to an end, a uh, way to get certain results. So I would, I would agree with Shaler that that fails, and Shaler also makes some other interesting points, like that there are different ethical vocations. It's not like we all have the same duty. Each person has their own duties duties based on your very specific relationships with certain people. And so I think you need something like that insight. Um, I think Kant would see all of us as ethical failures because none of us can ever fully purify our mind from these duties that we must meet. They're regulative ideas, right, that we should be trying to do our duty as much as we can, but it's very high, hard to find somebody who is not contaminated by any non-ethical motives when they make their ethical decisions. Uh, and the results we might get, if we, the closer we are to achieving that, the less pleasant we might become as people. Kant gives that crazy example where two people help somebody in need, and one of them is very enthusiastic and passionate about it, very altruistic. And the other person is kind of cold and flinty and says, I'm, no, don't thank me, I'm only doing it because it's my universal duty. And Kant prefers that second person. Yeah. It's the one who looks which I think is counterintuitive for most of us. Intuitive, we all recognize there's something about passion that is ethical. Now, Lingus made this case in the last paper I saw. He compared two mothers. Let's say one mother just really loves her kids. She's just, you know, smothering them with affection. And the other one has read up in textbooks about how to be the perfect parent and is following all the rules. Like, we would all see the first as the better mother. Um, even if the second one is 
actually following the most up-to-date, cutting-edge parenting rules that you can find anywhere. And I would agree with that. I agree that's a problem with, with Kant. Um, as, as far as triple O, there's not this sense that ethics is this hopeless failure because we can never reach the perfect ethical situation decontaminated of all ulterior motives because um, we're not trying to get a purified duty that has no connection with the outside world. We're trying to get some deeper attachment with the outside world. Uh, I, I can't remember if I mentioned in this book the Onion article called why can't anyone tell I'm wearing this business suit, ironically? Is that in this book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the Onion, which usually hits the nail on the head, had an editorial 10 or 15 years ago called, Why Can't Anyone Tell That I'm Wearing This Business Suit, Ironically? And it's about this guy who starts off with his hipster friends in Brooklyn and then decides it will be cute to wear a business suit to a party, and his friends come up and call him a sob. He said, my irony was so over their heads, they didn't even realize I was being ironic. And then he buys a briefcase and fills it with real legal briefs. And then he ironically applies for a job at a law firm and gets the job. And so he frames his first check as an irony trophy. And since the checks keep coming, he figures, hey, might as well cash them. I need to buy all this ironic stuff. <laughs> and it gets deeper and deeper. And by the end, he says, you know, I'm, I'm riding the train at 7.30 every morning. And he's I'm thinking, these people really think I'm one of them? You know, they so don't get it. And then finally, he ends up ironically marrying someone he calls this clueless girl from Connecticut who likes shopping and everything. And he says, we even have these two creepy, ironic kids. And they look like something out of a Dick and Jane book from the 50s. <laughs> so by the end, he's, he's lived his entire life as this ironist. But look where it's gotten him. He's actually married with the two kids and what people offer. So there's a sense in which the, the, um, the attempt to get beyond the passion with this ironic meta critique fails. And Zizek has another funny example, which is the, he um, agrees with me on this point. Zizek talks about being in Germany and watching a documentary on neo-Nazi skinheads. And the interviewer asks them, why are you racist? And he expects them to unleash this flood of racist invective. And instead, this guy says, um, I'm, a, I'm a skinhead because of the breakdown of paternal authority and, and diminishing upward mobility. <laughs> <laughs> it's the sociological language. And see, Zizek says that, that doesn't get him out of it. Right? That's part of the game. The irony is part of the game. And he claims that the Soviet system was shot through with this. Everybody inside the Soviet system was making ironic statements about it. And yes, they, yet they were still part of it. So the ethics of irony has to go, I think. And we're already seeing moves away from irony, right? The, the art I most like, the contemporary art I most like, and it's quite a bit of it now, it's kind of uncynical, not a meta critique of capitalism or a meta critique of society, but it's simply doing stuff with pretty colors and shapes again, or doing something that you can get involved with again. So I think maybe we've uh, uh, exhausted the idea of critique as irony and distance. Um, I'd like to say there are two kinds of critique. Even in our language, there are two kinds of critique. The one is the critique where you say, you know, you think Dickens' Great Expectations is actually about this boy who ends up getting a great fortune from dubious sources, but actually it's about class relations in Victorian England. This, this is the critic's standpoint of superiority. You get Darwinist literary critics now who say the Iliad is about natural selection, the stronger warriors are killing the weaker warriors, pretty impoverished reading of Homer. Um, but then there's also this other kind of critique you find wine criticism, food criticism, and these are not you know, Marxist or feminist meta-critiques of food. They're attempts to give a kind of non-critical, kind of poetic evocation of what's there. And Daniel Dennett, I, I think I did mention that in this book, Daniel Dennett has this wonderfully horrible passage on wine tasting. He's mm -hmm. one of the most reductive, reductive philosophers. In fact, he says that, you know, fine wines and velvety pinot but lacking in stamina. This is totally pretentious garbage, Dennett says. Just pour it into a machine, let it kick out the formula. That's real wine tasting. I think we all re realize something is lost when you do that. Criticism in this sense, literary criticism, architecture criticism, art criticism, is never going to be that kind of criticism where you just boil a thing down to its elements. Because it cannot reduce its objects like that. It has to appreciate the savor of these objects. And that's why, um, that's why we run the professional risk of pretension in our fields. Because we cannot use direct language in the way that the sciences do. We're talking about an object with something more than its qualities. So you're always going to run the risk of having Derrida's and such figures in, in our fields. Whereas these people will be laughed out of the sciences. Because in the sciences, the whole point is to replace a name with true prose descriptions of the thing you're talking about. That's, that's how you do it. Uh, that's not what we do in fields like philosophy. Uh, and that's why I think philosophy is not a science. That's another, another question. Rob. Uh, Simon, welcome. I would totally disagree with you and insist, uh, and perhaps not with Graham, 
and insist that the whole hammer metaphor only works if you start with a sense of a possibility of the hammer. And if the hammer has no possibility of actually being complete, then I think the whole argument collapses. So no, I think art has to have a idealistic, perhaps it is, sense of the possibility of the hammer. So this, this okay. I don't want to reclaim the conversation, but just as a footnote, I, we remain in total disagreement. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what I'm trying to figure out here is how um, the objects are, which are thrown over the table here, how they differ, because there, there's two kinds of objects continuously, starting with your argument on the one that is uh, in Heidegger's notion, present at hand and uh, uh, ready at hand, uh, and both are, I guess, ontological objects and real. And um, in the examples you gave, I can hear uh, Dennett talking about his very much present at hand kind of object, which he thinks he's very passionate about, uh, but not the thing which he holds in his hand. The wine, he doesn't care about. He cares about his theory about wine. So the, the arguments are running beside each other. They're, they're, they're not intertwined. They're, they're different kind of arguments. And I think that uh, might be the issue as well with uh, uh, people like Trump or managers who uh, <coughs> uh, look at the theory they're very passionate about and how they can control their work instead of reality which is complex and therefore fuzzy and therefore difficult to deal with. Um, Okay, as far as two and four hundred headed Heidegger, the, that's the idea in his tool analysis at the beginning of being in time that present at hand are the things that we, we see or think about, ready to hand are the things that we're using, that we're not normally thinking about. And he does tend to treat that as a taxonomy, that there are two different kinds of objects. That doesn't really work though, you think, because um, when you're hammering, it's a ready to hand object, but then if it breaks, it becomes a present at hand object because it's, it's there in front of you. And so the, his attempt to make it a taxonomy collapses quickly. And incidentally, I don't think philosophy should ever begin with a taxon. It must think different kinds of objects. And the reason is you need to talk first about features that belong to all objects. I think one of the failings of philosophy, since at least uh, Christian philosophy in the early Middle Ages, is that it's always been a taxon. For Christian philosophy, it was God and all the created. And then in modern times, that simply became thought and world. In Heidegger, you have the two things, theory and praxis. And if you think about it, um, that's not that succession, that's, uh, sorry, that distinction doesn't really hold up because you, you can't really say that theory or perception are less close to the object than praxis is. So Heidegger makes the argument that if I make a theory about this chair, if I look at the chair, I'm distorting it through, cutting its being down to size, treating it from its outward look. The problem is that praxis does the same. So if I'm using the chair, I'm not any closer to it than when I'm looking at it. It might be less conscious, but it's still not using all the features of the chair. It's, I think, both sides of Heidegger's distinction rest on a deeper distinction, which is the, the chair itself, apart from either of those. And uh, that's something Heideggerians never talk about. Heidegger's widely read by almost everybody is a distinction between theory and practice, that all theory is grounded in this unconscious background practice, and so this, this sociological framework in which all conscious theory happens. But that's, there's more going on than that, in Heidegger. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I would say that I would say that rather than being different kinds of objects, so and four on and are two different modes in which any object can exist. It can exist relationally, or it can exist non-relationally in its own right. An object in ontology is all about this non-relational being. Heidegger doesn't really have that. Heidegger has being with a capital B that's non-relational, but he doesn't tend to like to think of it as broken up into parts. He's one of those philosophers who like to think that being is one until the human mind breaks into parts. There's a long tradition of that going back to Okay, well, it's a fun <coughs> moment then to uh, invite you all to take your own chosen critical um, appreciation of the coffee downstairs. <laughs> we'll we'll come back in half an hour and share our share our findings. Okay.